The importance attached to the mediatization of war has long been acknowledged. From Alexander the Great's effective use of spreading propaganda to today's embedded journalism programs or terrorists' public beheading videos. Military actors throughout history have recognized and used the media platforms of their time as a form of soft power weapon. And yet, until the emergence of digital new media technology in 2002, most state-of-the-art media technology had tended at first to predominantly favor empires and states, not non-state military actors. For example, the invention of the telegraph in 1794, radio airwaves after World War I, or television after World War II, constituted media platforms that, because of their infrastructural nature, costs, maintenance, and need for large numbers of highly specialized professionals, could, at the time of their inception, only be afforded by a small number of rich and politically powerful actors such as empires, states, and media conglomerates. Non-state actors simply lacked the capacities to build, let alone maintain and operate, such vast and costly media platforms. On occasion, and only with a significant delay, trickle-down effects would make some of these technologies affordable to non-state actors. This means that with each new media platform innovation between the 19th and 20th century, state actors have tended to sustain an asymmetric structural advantage over non-state actors regarding their capability to mass mediatize wars. The innovations in media technology have thereby tended to retain, if not widen, the corridor of actions for states more than they did for irregular forces, terrorists or rebels. This meant furthermore, as Thomas Ridd and Mark Hecker have shown in their book War 2.0, that non-state actors for most of the 19th century perceived the empires and states communications facilities as a military target. A target that could be physically attacked to weaken the armies of states and empires. For instance, by cutting down telegraph masts. Alternatively, following the Second World War, irregulars started using media outlets as a weapon. A good example here is the way in which the North Vietnamese managed to use US media against the US government. It shows how irregulars successfully used and manipulated US media as a weapon to attack and undermine the moral support for the war in Vietnam. Therefore, prior to the digital media revolution, irregulars tended to use traditional mass communication platforms as either a military target or as a weapon. An indication of the extent to which the structural form and trajectory of the various information revolutions spanning the last two centuries had benefited the armies of states and empires rather than irregular forces. The emergence of the latest information revolution, however, has reversed this historical trend. Web 2.0 constitutes neither a target nor a weapon, but for irregulars has come to serve as an extended strategic operations platform. The different structural nature of digital new media platforms combined with its low costs and commoditized applications, constitutes the first media revolution which has benefited non-state and irregular groups far more than it has governments and counterinsurgents. In other words, old ways of war and communication are not necessarily coming apart, but are being augmented by the coming about of a new self-organizing networked mediascape. In this process, 
the technological asymmetries of the past regarding the global media scape have been rebalanced as digital media technology has increased the options for irregulars more than for governments and their armies. In this sense, the complex, decentralized and bottom-up nature of today's digital media technology is rocking the traditional hierarchies, appending traditional players, changing the global media environment and thereby the mediatization of war. Through this transformation from a multipolar to a heteropolar media landscape, states and non-state actors alike now possess the technological capacity to wage their wars in and through global media platforms. As a result, today's wars are not only fought interactively on the ground in the streets of Baghdad or in the valleys of the Hindu Kush mountains, but also and increasingly through today's newly emerging heteropolar mediascape. In this visual war of spectacles, media technology has become a medium of war, a soft power weapon in its own right. Given the strategic importance that today's military actors attach to the use of media as a soft power weapon, that is, a weapon that while it does not kill, is still seen and used as a powerful tool in the actors' arsenals and is seen as an integral part of their overall warfighting strategy. And given the ubiquity, simultaneity and instantaneity of these soft power weapons raises important questions. What are the strategic rationales behind the ways in which non-state military actors mediatize their wars? How is media being used? What does it convey? And what are its desired effects?